Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Change on the Run podcast, where we discuss common change challenges and ways to address them when we're short of time. And I'm your host, Phil Buckley. Today's topic is optimizing your limited time. Most people have fewer resources to fulfill their change role than they need. With full calendars and large to-do lists, they must choose the most important activities to spend their time on. Determining which activities offers the most value is one of the biggest personal and project success factors. So how do you optimize your time on a change initiative to maximize your contribution to achieve its outcomes? And my guest today is Yvonne Tevno. Yvonne, welcome to the show. Oh, Phil, it's so good to be here. You know, I'm a fan. And so to be honored by being part of your podcast series is a real delight. Thank you, Yvonne. Yvonne has over 30 years of change management, strategy development and implementation, and mentoring experience. She is an independent change consultant who has extensive business acumen and sales effectiveness experience in financial services. Yvonne holds designations as a certified change management professional and an accredited change manager master from the Association of Change Management Professionals and the Change Management Institute, and is the only change practitioner in Canada to hold these two designations. Yvonne, congratulations. I know the rigor of both programs, and it's a huge accomplishment to have both of them. What's been your experience with optimizing your time during change? I'll tell you what I love most about that question is the word optimize. I've been thinking about time and change and how they juxtapose. And the truth is that change distorts time. It makes things that feel like they are imminent, far off in the distance, and it makes things that are far off in the distance feel imminent. So the ability to optimize that and to find the right balance based on a huge number of audiences that a change practitioner deals with at any point in the change is really a huge part of the art in the art and the science of change management support. It's such an interesting insight too, because you are on a change initiative or you're going through change. It's almost like a biosphere of time where you have a group of different people with different stakeholder needs, all going toward one destination, but timing can be quite different in their minds. And could you describe the difference between regular operating roles and managing through your time and the particularities of being on a change assignment? I think one of the biggest challenges in tackling a change initiative is helping the senior executive team remember that they are anywhere from you know six months to sometimes two years ahead of the people who end up being directly impacted by the end result change so given the amount of things that are on a senior executive's plate it can be one of a number of changes all at different stages that they are supporting or sponsoring or initiating and so as a change practitioner, when you're bringing out a sponsorship roadmap and you're talking about a town hall series or ask me anything sessions, sometimes the senior executive will feel like, oh gosh, like we talked about that last month. Like, are you sure they want to continue to hear about it? And so being able to remind the senior executive and support them and encourage in repeating what they may feel as a redundant message, something that is going to sound dated or no longer relevant is actually exactly what that audience needs to hear at that point in time. And certainly there's feedback loops that can help with that, right? So we did a little pulse survey. People are still wondering, why are they wondering? We've mentioned it. We've communicated it. We've given them job aids. Well, you know, it just takes time for people to absorb change. And so as the change sponsor, even though you might wonder why they're still not quite there. The truth is they're not. So let's go at it. Another Q&A session, another opportunity for them to see your confidence in the change and then move that forward. On the other side, and particularly for the direct manager of those that are directly impacted by the change, they may feel like it's coming really fast. Like, oh, it feels like we just heard about this. I'm diving my people into training. They're still adapting to whatever the prospective change is. 
They're still not internalizing the change. And all of a sudden, the senior team are starting to talk about a future change. And whoa, wait a minute, like we barely got this one digested. So the ability to support both of those leadership audiences through a change by meeting them where they're at, giving them the tactics and endorsements to support them at that moment in time really captures that word optimize. How do you help leaders be realistic about the amount of time when they've already gone through the curve and they're ready for that next change to move forward? I think part of it is the data that can come back, the feedback loops. And so that's a little bit of the science of it. You know, people are at a 3.5 on a scale of one to five. So until they're at least at a 4.2, we don't want to move to the next stage. So that certainly resonates with senior audiences. You know, it's fact based, but there's also that art component of it and being able to put that senior person emotionally back in the state that they were perhaps at when they first heard of the change and reminding them of that. So do you recall when this was first signaled in the offsite a year and a half ago? How did you feel at that time? What did you think? Oh, I didn't think it was going to happen. We had tried it before, all of those things. And so being able to take them back as well and put them back in that emotional position of learning and their own acceptance journey is also an important part of bringing that art component of helping their teams through the change as well. Can you give a few examples of the downsides of poor time management on a change initiative? One of the key things that through change as a change practitioner, you look for is time with the senior executive that follows the continuum of change. So whether it's a regular cadence of pre-booked meetings, bi-weekly or monthly or whatever that routine is, invariably when you start out with a change, there's this sense of, oh, surely we don't need meetings that long. The change is being announced on this date. Why would we need change updates following that. So being able to get an early buy-in to the, hey, we'll cancel it if we don't need it. It's very easy to do. And as a senior person, you know that that time will be redeployed very quickly, filled up. So don't worry about having spare time on your calendar because that's not going to happen. But protecting that time in advance and earning the right to then release it is a huge step. One of the practices that I have is spending my time thinking about how long will it take to work our way through this problem? And when do we anticipate that we will be in a position to ask for senior support, to maybe ask for a decision, or to provide, you know, kind of a rich update based on the information. Get that date in the senior team's calendar, and then manage your scope towards that date. There's going to be something to share with them or ask them or bring them along with at that time. You might not know today, what is it I'm going to be asking you or guiding you on six weeks from now, but six weeks through a major change is a long time. And so then as you start to approach that date, you can fine tune exactly what the relevant content is. You know that it's partially update. It's going to be partially asking for decisions. It's going to be determining readiness for a next phase of change, all of those things. But getting the placeholder in the calendars and then working towards that is a huge benefit. Many times I've been in the midst of a change and people kind of have their head up and go, oh, well, we're going to need to keep talk with the senior team about this next week. Oh, remember that booking? That recurrence comes up 10 days from now. Maybe not quite as early as we'd like, but 10 days next week, it's all in and it's already protected. People have already accepted and we already worked around any vacations or absences from office that might impede. So people are like, wow, it magically appeared. Well, it didn't magically appear. There was a planning component that went along with it that's built based off experience. But it feels magic when you're in that moment. 
Oh, certainly. And that's such a huge tip for the listeners and, and a great reminder for me too, that you're pre-booking. There's a theme to your guidance and your stories, which is a respect for everyone's time. I'm not sure if you've been in a scenario where there's a three hour meeting and it really was a half an hour meeting, sort of that lack of respect that people are busy. They've got a lot to do. How important is that in managing, not only optimizing your time, but the time of all the stakeholders? It's a great question because when you say three hour meeting, I immediately freeze because <laughs> <laughs> I can't think about anything for three hours, not even a good movie. And it goes past, you know, two hours, like wait, I start to twitch. But in terms of that whole construct, people need to talk talk out loud and think out loud through times of change. And people includes senior teams as well as the teams being directly impacted. And they need time to move forward. Cut bait. You know, we've, we've had enough conversation about it. It's time to move forward and make a decision. And so the nuance of knowing where an audience is at, at that point in time, is really important to understanding what Spec looks like. The challenge of a large meeting at any point in time is that you're never going to hit the right mark for everyone. There's going to be people who are wanting to have more dialogue, and there's going to be people who already feel that there's been way too much talk about it. So how do you find that right balance? A lot of that is driven off the company culture. As a change practitioner, in my case, as an independent change practitioner, it's really important to understand the nuance of what a good meeting looks like in that organizational culture. What that might mean is maybe three hours is the most respectful length of time because people are at that stage in the journey as a general audience where they do need the time to think out loud to open their right and their left brains as part of that conversation. Or it's not the right time for that discussion. Rather than a three-hour discussion, you're better off with six 30-minute conversations over the space of a period of time. It's a challenge, right? What's respect for one might not be respect for all. What's respect at one point in time might not be the same as at another point in time. And the corporate culture and using that to guide and shape what that might look like is also critical to your success in finding the right balance of that art and science as well. I'm wondering, you talked about the cultural aspects of knowing what's right for a group or, or for the whole organization, which is such an important input to what success looks like and how you optimize your time. Have you, have you ever had an experience where the culture rewards firefighting? So it, it is that classic scenario of pulling it out of the fire and, and people are rewarded for improving something that has gone wrong versus planning to make sure that it doesn't go wrong in the first place. How do you face a culture like that? to make sure that every time is optimized. That is such a prevalent reality in organizations. So people love to feel alive. They love to feel energized. They love to feel like the champion of something that no one else could achieve because it gets their blood flowing, gets their endorphins going, all of those things. So the whole idea of firefighting and kind of rallying up hero culture, it actually can be a self-fulfilling prophecy where it makes me feel alive. I don't realize that I'm getting juiced by it. So I keep going there over and over. And I wonder why I keep ending up here. So one of the tactics that I use in my role being one to see what others don't see, to help people feel what others maybe don't feel naturally to have it emerge through to the top of the pile, is to actually, in some cases, create almost false firefighting urgency. Wow. So <laughs> it's a little, <laughs> no pun intended, a little bit smoke and mirrors. You create deadlines that generate that same urgency an energy that comes from firefighting, but you use those deadlines very planfully to execute parts of your change journey. So 
we must have this framework ready by this date because our executive meeting is on the Thursday. And so it creates that, gosh, we need it ready so that it can be sent out as a pre-read. It creates that sense of energy and hurry and let's rally up and get that thing built and thought through and discussed so that we can present our best foot forward. So sometimes when that is an inherent part of the culture, you use the culture to bring itself along. You take advantage of whatever the flavor is that's going to bring that team to life the most and lean into that, embrace it and leverage it in order to help the team be the best they can. That's fantastic. You raise a great point about going to people where they are and working within their cultures so that you can move them forward. And I've seen in the past, and perhaps I've done it, is expounding on best practice. And the best practice is so counterculture to the culture that they have that it's too far for them to go. So one is there's an organ rejection Two is they might not have the skills to go there. And the third one is probably the best response is just to ignore it and just be themselves. Have you seen people do that? And yes, it's best practice, but probably it's worst practice because that group can't follow it. One of the questions that I ask myself from time to time is, for example, create a guiding coalition. One of the phrases that we've heard over and over again as part of Cotter's philosophies of leading change. Fantastic. Create a guiding coalition. Have I ever experienced an effective change without a guiding coalition? The answer is yes, absolutely. So would a guiding coalition have made it made easier? Maybe. But if I'm in a culture, for example, of compliance, where people just check the boxes because that's the way that the organization is structured, then this philosophy of belief, and vision, and energized about the change, it's a lovely concept. But if the culture is one of executing against process or the rules or the, the rigor that the organization itself has in place, then I'm going to be a hundred times farther ahead as a change practitioner, supporting the business in that change by helping them think through what is the best and most reliable process approach to, to constructing this change that you can think of? And how do we ensure that gets followed? We ensure that back doors are closed. And so there's an example of where the best practice absolutely has application and would live and thrive in many, many environments. But in some environments, it might not even be necessary. And in fact, might hinder, you know, why are you telling me all that stuff? Just tell me, tell me what to do. Just tell me what, what's the rule I'm supposed to follow. And so might even hinder moving forward with a change in an accelerated pace. That is so true. And it's all about focusing on the individuals and what they need to move forward. And, and picking things that would work well, and again, avoiding things that wouldn't. Are there common pitfalls people on change assignments fall into about optimizing their time? Like things that seem like they would be good and logical, but they just don't optimize their time. The optimizing time, again, optimize. I love that word because it's not black and white. It's not this idea that this is the way that it always works. So one of the key factors of optimizing time is being able to adjust. An example would be, oh, well, we had set up these biweekly meetings and we're finding that we're not getting through enough information. Okay, so let's set up weekly meetings or add a weekly meeting in between for the next six weeks. But we had already decided bi-weekly was the right answer. And so trying to find a way of saying, yes, we made that decision based on what we knew at that moment in time and believed it to be the best decision. And now we've earned the right to make a different decision. So that ability to be adaptable, another part is documentation. And I want to say a small d documentation. I know in the change on the run, it talks about a decision, a decision grid or a decision cycle in terms of when will decisions need to be made. And 
in many projects, I work with the project management team and we will document key decisions. And more than once, we will have senior teams go back to their original decision and change it. And as a project team, sometimes we might hold that up and say, wait a minute, you made a decision and we moved on based on that. The truth is they have the right to change their decision. Our job then is to adapt, to understand the implications, to revise our approach based on revised decisions, helping them understand the consequences, both the natural consequences as well as the unintended consequences of revising a decision. Part of that is communication, documentation. Remember last February, you made the decision on a basis. What has changed? How has it changed? Here's the downstream potential impact of revising that change. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Well, if you're okay with it, then I am too. Agility is such an important aspect in change. Someone once said, don't fall in love with your plan because it's only based on the information that you had at that time. And it needs to be fluid, given that there's so many external factors that impact a a change initiative and the plan and, and time. How do you make room in your schedule to manage the changes that naturally occur that require your attention? Some of the practices that I talked about in terms of how you support and lead a business change, recurring appointments, those kinds of things are as important for myself as contributor to that project as they are for the teams. And then having moments of deep thing. So If you're in an agile execution cycle, it might be the quarterly planning, that time for, okay, what did we actually do last quarter? How do we look to the next quarter? In a waterfall project might be triggered by certain gate. And so at the planning gate, then we have a deep think. At the readiness gate, we have another deep think. At the shortly after implementation. So being ahead of knowing when you need those Big think moments is also important for yourself personally. Mm -hmm. Then there's crazy little things like just putting a buffer. If you know that you have a stakeholder who just takes a minute to get going, you know, maybe is always compressed in coming late from another meeting or those kinds of things. And you know that once they get started and they're engaged, they want to continue. Don't plan another meeting right after it. Hold yourself a buffer time so that when they're ready to talk, you're ready to listen and you're not feeling like, oh my gosh, now somebody else is running late or I'm compressing them because of that. So being good to yourself and knowing how to manage that in context of the stakeholders as well. That's great. And given the time pressure within changes and everyone tends to have more than enough to do within their schedules, sometimes it can lead to burnout where people are trying to get everything done. But the to-do lists, they never go away. There's always things that are left undone and you have to prioritize your time. But if you don't have that philosophy, you can try and do everything and then slowly burn out. How do you manage or mitigate that risk? I think managing volume, it's really hard to do because there can be so many good ideas that you know could make a difference. It's really hard to say we don't have capacity to do them all. I read this really great article many, many years ago called The Power of Saying No. And the concept was if you don't say no to something, you're actually saying no to everything. So rather than doing one or two things really, really well, you're just doing a washed out version of a whole bunch of things instead. One of the ways that over time, you know, the standard urgent important grid, I find it really useful. X number of initiatives in your top right quadrant. So it doesn't mean that it's not urgent or important. It means that it is not as urgent or important as the items that you have in that top right. Another tool that I use for this kind of balancing is a roadmap. And no sometimes means no, not now. And having that ability to say, let's take these two, drive them today. And Agile, I think, certainly works well for that. Let's focus on the two best and biggest benefits today. And then these others, let's think about them again in another month. And then there's just the really human stuff about asking people how they're doing 
and being prepared to hear the answer, good, bad, or otherwise. Understanding is this event moment or is this a like need to strategize about this moment and being whole enough ourselves as supports, as coaches and mentors through these changes that we know as well that we play that role and we are that sounding board and thought partner and that part of what we do is help people through their own emotions of change and help them support the teams that they lead as well. Thank you, Vaughn. That's great advice. And it's so interesting talking about time management and time within change, because it's such a challenge, especially when there are multiple changes going on. And given the spirit of change on the run, if you only had time to do one thing to optimize your time that would give you that 80-20 benefit, what's that one thing you would focus on? I would focus on thinking. Thinking and planning. So often we're reacting and managing and adapting and iterating that extra hour of thinking, just looking ahead to the two weeks, the four weeks, the four months, thinking about the different audiences, where they're at, why they feel that way at any particular point in time, and actually just taking the time to give ourselves the head and heart space to be able to support teams the most effectively. I know it feels like an untask when you say, I'm going to take time to think, but in so many ways, taking a little more time to think and a little less time on the do helps us focus the do on the things that actually make the biggest difference. Excellent. Great advice. Thank you for sharing. And just as we close off on the show, is there an insight or a consideration or a tip you'd like to share with the listeners overall about the topic of optimizing your time? I think one of the aspects of optimizing your time as a change practitioner is that you are often a solo, a one-person show in a project team. So your need to have outside sources, either other change practitioners, other resource bases, people you can go to, to either coach, mentor, guide you in thinking out loud through that change can be really critical because sometimes when you are so deep in the muck, you don't always see the path that could be right in front of you with two or three great questions from an experienced change practitioner whose opinion you value, who you trust, who you're able to share enough of the background and scenario that they can help move you forward quickly, efficiently with a thought that you just had yourself, but maybe hadn't even emerged because you were so busy thinking about other things and other people. Thanks so much. And Yvonne, thank you for being on the podcast. I really appreciate your perspectives. How can people get in contact with you? My LinkedIn is absolutely my go-to, Yvonne Taveno. I'm sure you'll have the word spelt there somewhere. <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> uh, my LinkedIn is definitely the best way to get in touch with me. Oh, great. Absolutely. Well, we'll have it in the show notes. And thanks again, Yvonne, for being on the show. It means so much to me and, and I appreciate it. Thanks again for taking the time. Thank you, Phil. And to the listeners, thank you for listening. And always, if there's anyone that you think could benefit from Yvonne's and my conversation, please share it freely. And until the next time, I wish you all the best as you continue to lead change.